brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. I'm painting a picture for you all too. I had a different one for the kids, but I found one this week that uh, relates to our text. Actually, it's, well, it's a series of paintings. Now, these were painted by um, a Renaissance painter named Albrecht Durer. I'll probably just call him Albert, because that's a bit easier for me. And the first picture you're going to see here in just a moment is uh, a picture of, well, he's called um, the impenitent thief, or the second, or the first thief. Sometimes actually Albrecht Durer called him the evil thief. And you can see from this painting that he looks really like a defeated man. He's been painted in such a way that his face is covered up so that you can't really look him in the eye even. His hair covers that, you can see, and I think that's intentional. I think we're meant to get the sense here that this man is almost covering his face, oh, maybe with shame, maybe feeling unworthy. Right? He's just got that sense. He's looking down almost as though the weight of the world is bearing down on his shoulders. Now, the second painting that you're going to see actually hung right next to the first one. And this is the, uh, the second thief. And you can see that he looks noticeably different. His face is not downcast. His face is not covered, but he's looking up. He looks like a man who has, in a way, experienced victory, and he has. And of course, these two paintings are based on our scripture text that we've looked at this morning from the Gospel of Luke. These two uh, capture the two thieves that were crucified next to Jesus on the cross. And they both have a lot to show us. They actually both have a lot that they can do to point us to the Gospel. Both of them, the so-called evil thief, the impenitent thief, I'll just call him the first thief, and the second thief will show us something important in our relationship with God. And actually, I want us to see three things altogether, three things. The first is the truth that we, uh, the truth about who we really are. When we listen carefully to these two themes, we see the truth about who we really are. That's the first thing. And then the second thing is the mercy that sets us free. The mercy that sets us free. And finally, the hope that sustains us. Okay, so the truth about who we really are, the mercy that sets us free, and the hope that sustains us. Now, I think it's easy for us, and I think we often do this, we look at the, the first thief, the, the impenitent thief, and it's easy to vilify him, right? It's easy to look at him and say, what a terrible person this guy was, because here he is in his dying moments, he's probably hours away from death, and yet he continues to mock Jesus. He continues to make fun of him and insult him. And we say, how could a person possibly do that? What kind of a person would, would do that? Um, however, I think we do better to see ourselves, to recognize ourselves, or at least something about ourselves, in this person. What does this thief say to Jesus? He, he really goes along with, with all the crowd, doesn't he? I mean, if you remember, if you were here from last week, you remember that the, uh, the crowds are taunting Jesus, and they're really saying the same thing. If you really are the Son of God, save yourself. If you really have the power that you claim to have, save yourself. Come down from the cross. And this second, or this first thief, really just echoes that, but he puts his own twist on it. He, doesn't just, he says, if you really are the Son of God, if you really are the Christ, then save yourself and us too. He adds that. He says, save us too. He's really making a demand of Jesus, isn't he? He's really saying, Jesus, if you have all this power that you claim to have, fix my problem. Rescue me. Get me out of this situation. You claim to be from God. You claim to be able to do anything. And if that's true, then prove it. And 
and get me off of this cross. Get me out of this suffering. Get me out of this pain. Get me down from this cross. Fix me. Fix my problem. Fix my situation. And we can't really blame him. Actually, can we? I mean, he has a pretty urgent need. He's suffering. He's in pain that is pretty unimaginable for just about any of us here. He's hurting physically, emotionally. And he says, Jesus, fix me. Fix my problem. Now, if we're honest with ourselves, I think we've probably all prayed a prayer a little bit like that at some point or another, right? I mean, we have a problem and we go to Jesus and we say, Jesus, help. And that's not always a bad thing to do, actually. In fact, often it's appropriate. It's the right thing to do. But sometimes we boil Jesus down just to someone, just a repairman, just someone who can come into our life and deal with our problems and make life easier for us. Sometimes we just want Jesus for what he can do for us. Jesus, cure me. Heal me. Jesus, get me a new job. Jesus, fix my marriage. And again, those are not the wrong things to ask for. But if they're the only things that we ask for, we have to ask ourselves that question. Are we making, are we valuing Jesus the way that this man on the cross values Jesus? Someone who can just fix the immediate problem. See, here's how we know the difference. Here's how we know that we're not just looking to Jesus for help, but actually that we're only valuing him for what he can do for us. Ask yourself what happens when God doesn't fix your problem the way you want it. You ask God to heal you, and you pray for it, and he doesn't. The disease stays, not cured. That would be disappointing. That would be discouraging. That would be sad. But do you become resentful? You say in your heart, God, you should have fixed that. You had to fix that. I prayed and prayed and prayed, and you didn't come through for me. There's a difference there. You're resenting God. You're becoming bitter at God because he didn't do for you what you wanted him to do. Right? And then you have to wonder if you're valuing Jesus more for what he can do for you than for who he is. Now, the second thief is a contrast in a lot of ways, isn't he? You look at verse 41, and the second thief turns to the first thief, and he says, don't you see, we are being punished justly. We're being punished justly. We're getting what we deserve. There's a lot of ways to understand that, I think. And probably the, the, the easiest way would be to say, you know what, we've lived really bad lives, and our actions have finally caught up with us. Rome arrested us, the police found us, dragged us to court, and now here we are. We're being punished properly by the government. And that is a possibility. But I think, I think there's a, 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 another way to look at this. It's maybe a little more nuanced, but actually I think it makes a little more sense. And that, when, when you look at the word that is used to describe who these criminals were, it's a word that is most commonly used to talk about people who rebelled against the state because they thought the state was unfair and unjust and corrupt. They were, you might call them seditionists today, if you know the fancy language. Um, treason, maybe, right? They see the government as unfair, and so they're going to rebel against it and try to, you know, revolt, lead the people in revolt against the government. That's the word that's most commonly used to describe these thieves. They hated the Roman government, they thought it was unjust, and they wanted to lead a rebellion against it. Now, if that is the case, then it's hard to imagine these thieves saying, you know what, this Roman government that we hate and that we think is corrupt and we think is evil and unjust, they're punishing us fairly. That, that doesn't seem to fit. It, it doesn't seem that these two men would see such a you know, the punishment that they're getting from Rome as fair. And so what I think the second thief is saying is, He's having a spiritual awakening of sorts. He's realizing that he's about to meet his maker, he's about to die, and he's going to be held up to a much higher standard of justice. He's realizing that he's, his whole life is about to be measured not just by the standard of Rome, which he probably could 
care less about anyone's, but by the standard of God's justice. He's saying, we're about to stand before God, and He is the one who is going to judge us. And don't you see that when we are measured by that standard of justice, then we are getting exactly what we deserve. We deserve this in the eyes of God. See, he's having this moment of awakening where he realizes that he realizes the truth about himself. He realizes that he is deserving of this punishment and this condemnation. And, and, and he's looking inside of himself and he realizes the truth. Now for many of us, well that is where spiritual renewal begins, is knowing the truth about ourselves, knowing the truth about our brokenness and our fallenness and our sinfulness. And it's a truth that most of us prefer to avoid, isn't it? We don't like to face the truth about who we really are. We don't like to face our own shortcomings, our own weaknesses, our own flaws. Um, I told some of you, I told this story in an evening service a couple weeks ago, and I thought I'd tell it again here. Uh, maybe you maybe haven't heard it. Um, I, some of you know I don't, I'm not big into cars, and when they, the thing that bugs me most is when they break down, that always is just a big stressor for me. And, you know, because then you got to pay for it and you got to deal with the hassle of it and then they tell you that it's just one thing wrong and the next thing you know there's ten things wrong, and, right? You know what, I'm not the only one that deals with that, right? You know that? Oh, okay, good. So when we moved here, we had this 95 Ford Taurus, kind of an older car, and uh, had a little problem in it that it was a sensor or something. So the engine light would come on infrequently, but it would come on often enough. A little green, ugly thing would flash in my dashboard. And, um, I knew it was, I found out it was really nothing to be too worried about, but still, every time that light would come on, it was just a reminder that something somewhere was not working the way it should, and I just did not like it. So I found, I'll share this with you, this is the easiest way to fix this, and it doesn't cost you anything, it's really simple. You just do this. If you're driving with 10 and 2, where the hands are supposed to be, then you just kind of put your palm up, and it makes you look kind of cool, and then you just slide that hand down just a little bit. So that when you look at the dashboard, you're not seeing the little orange ugly light anymore. You're just seeing your hand, and you say, there's no problem, right? Uh, it's free advice for you on how to fix your car with no cost to you. But in all honesty, you know, it, it occurs to me that that's kind of how we, we often like to go through life when, when there's a problem, especially when it's a problem about ourselves, when it's about our stubbornness, or it's about our pride, or it's about our greed. Or it's about our tendency to gossip, or it's about any other of a number of whole long list of things. And we like to do this, we like to cover it up. You've got a close friend who says, listen, I need to talk to you something. You know, you're, 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 you're doing this, you're always so judgmental, or you're always gossiping and it bothers me. And then you find, you find ways to keep that friend at arm's length. Your spouse brings up an issue or problem and says, it really bugs me when you do this. And I struggle with this myself because my tendency is to say, well, I don't really do that, or I do this, or no, you misunderstood me, no, that's not what I meant, right? You cover it up. Some of us have worked with people like that, right? You, or you have maybe a boss or someone that you know about, and, and they surround themselves with, with people that always tell them the things they want to hear, right? Yes, men. They don't like to be contradicted, and the minute Someone says something to the boss that contradicts the boss, and all of a sudden that person's packing up their desk and they're moving on, right? We don't like to face the problems. We don't like to face our sins and our weaknesses and our shortcomings. We keep people at a distance. We argue our way out of it. We try to find ways to justify ourselves. But what this first thief is showing us is that it, that spiritual awakening begins, our relationship with God begins and continues with facing the truth about who we really are. Acknowledging our sins, acknowledging our brokenness. And it's not easy to do, but you know what? It's the most liberating thing that can happen to us. It's the mercy that sets us free. Let me show you what that looks like. Um, verse 42. The second thief, after he speaks to the first and says, don't you see, we're getting what we deserve, we're measured by God's standard of justice, we fall far short of that, that's the truth about who we really are. And then he says to Jesus, remember me, Jesus, remember me, when you come into your kingdom. I want to draw your attention to what this thief does not say. He doesn't say, 
Jesus, what do I need to do to become a Christian? Jesus, I'm ready to pray the sinner's prayer. Would you meet me in that? He doesn't say, what are the, you know, tell me the gospel so I can believe it. He did, all he says is, just remember me. Just remember me. In, in his mind, possibly, perhaps, he's saying to himself, I know that I am so unworthy of God's kingdom. There's no hope for me. I can't get in. I'm not worthy. I don't deserve it. But maybe Jesus could just remember me when he goes into this kingdom. Maybe Jesus, when he enters into, into paradise, maybe he could just look back and, and think of me. Isn't that remarkable? He doesn't pray the sinner's prayer. He doesn't just says, Jesus, remember me. Just remember me. In, in that sense, this man is saying that it would be better for Jesus simply to remember me than to have Jesus fix my immediate problems. It would be better for me to be known by Jesus than to have Jesus come in and Ease my pain, fix my immediate situation. Better to be known by Christ than to have Jesus do what you want to do in the immediate moment. It's really the heart of what this man is saying. Jesus, remember me. Better to be remembered by Jesus eternally than fixed by him temporally. I mean, some of you know that song. You remember that one? It was uh, a lot of times it was sung at Billy Graham Crusades because it was written either by George Beverly Shea or Cliff Barrows, one of the two, I don't remember who. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather have Jesus than riches untold, right? I don't want Jesus for what Jesus can do for me. I don't want Jesus because Jesus can make me wealthy. I don't want Jesus for any of that. I just want Jesus. Jesus is more precious than anything Jesus is more precious than what Jesus can do for me. That's the heart of this man's prayer. That's the heart of this man's prayer. And that is, that is truly what, what the gospel is all about. It's about recognizing that Jesus is not just a servant who intends to come into our life and fix us up and give us what we want, but Jesus is someone who comes into our life to call us to holiness. Jesus is someone who, who is more precious to us than anything else, and he calls us to renewal. And he says, I will transform you. I want to make you new again. Now, we often come to Jesus, as I said a couple moments ago, we often come to Jesus because we have a problem. And I think that's okay. I actually think that's the way God often gets our attention. Right? Marriage isn't doing so well. You or someone you love is going through facing an illness, a sickness, there's a crisis in your family. If you're younger, it might be you've got a test next week and you just aren't sure you're going to remember everything. And you know what? God says, bring those things to me. Bring those needs to me. But one of the ways that you can tell you were growing in your faith is when God doesn't answer your prayers on the timetable that you had in mind or the way that you wanted, or he doesn't answer it really at all, and rather than getting angry and bitter and resentful towards God, you say, well, I am disappointed, I'm discouraged, I'm sad, frustrated. But I still trust that God is here and he's working. And if something is going wrong in my life, it's because God is going to use it to make me more and more like Jesus. You're able to rest in his care and in his work in your life. God may or may not fix your immediate problem, but he remains faithful to you, and his presence remains constant in your life. That's one of the ways you can sense that you're growing. You're trusting what God is doing, even when it's not quite the way you had in mind. Now, the second piece to this, that that's kind of the way that God's mercy works. And there's another part to that, and that's this. I've got to understand and appreciate the gravity of who these two men really were, these two thieves. Um, they're sometimes called thieves. Um, and we might get the mistaken idea that these were like shoplifters. Like they stole a loaf of bread to feed their starving family or something. Um, but Rome only executed really the worst kinds of criminals. These, these two men, let's not underestimate how how bad they really were. These two characters are about as violent 
and nasty as they come. If they moved next door to you, if they moved into your neighborhood, probably most of us here would go all activists on it. We would sign petitions, we'd write to our state representatives, our city council members, we'd do everything we could. And if that didn't work, we'd probably start shopping for a new home. Because they, they really were, they were that bad. They're more like terrorists than they are like the shoplifter at Winco. These are, these are bad people. Bad people. And yet, they are not out of reach of God's grace. The man says to Jesus, remember me. And Jesus says, okay. No. Well, were you really serious about that? No. Let's see if you really are serious. Let's see you prove what you meant here. There's none of that. Jesus simply says, okay, I'll remember you. In fact, you will be with me in paradise. You come to go, you get to go where I am going. This man, as terrible as he was, and all that he'd been guilty of and been responsible for, was not out of reach of God's grace. And what that means for you and for me today is that no matter what we may have done, past, present, or future, we are not out of reach of God's grace. God's grace comes to the most broken, <coughs> sinful, fallen people. And it extends them the grace of God through Christ. And if that's true, then that's, that's the kind of church that we need to become. We are people who have received that grace and we need to learn to extend that grace to those around us, to the most fallen people. We need to be conduits through which that grace flows to us. So there's the truth that tells us who we really are. We all fall short. There's something wrong with all of us. But God's mercy reaches to us no matter how far we fall. Now what is the hope that sustains us? Briefly, Jesus says this, you will be with me in paradise. Now that word that Jesus is using there is intentional. He's referring back to the original paradise, to the Garden of Eden. It's the word that Jewish people, Jewish, lots of people would have just immediately made that connection. In paradise, for everything else that it was, probably the most significant thing was that it was a place where Adam and Eve, humanity, humankind, had perfect, open, genuine, face-to-face -face relationship with God. They enjoyed communion with God. That longing in their soul was satisfied because God was there with them face to face. All that was largely lost at the fall, but now Jesus is saying it's, going, it's coming back, and you will regain that face to face, open communion with God. Right? To die is to go to be with Jesus, and it's to enjoy Him. Communion with God. Um, people a lot of times wonder this when there's a death in the family. Someone that you love passes away and you start to wonder, what happens? Where, where what happens? And the answer is this. Your soul, just as this man on the cross, your soul immediately, if your hope is in Jesus Christ, your soul immediately goes to be with Jesus. There's no soul sleep, there's no intermediate hanging around waiting for the rest of the world to end and no, no, you are immediately with Jesus in his presence. You are with him the moment you die, and then at the end of time when Jesus returns, then our bodies will be resurrected again and raised back to life, but in the moment that you die, you are immediately with Jesus. Now think about the way that that must have changed this man's outlook. He's nearing the end of his life anyways. He's suffering incredibly. And Jesus says, when you die, you'll be with me. His suffering didn't change in one sense. He didn't get down from the cross, didn't get something to ease the pain physically. 
But that knowledge and that assurance that soon he would be with Jesus must have changed how he endured his suffering. He must have said, this is painful, this is going to get worse, this is terrible, but when it's over, I will be with Jesus. Think about how that speaks to us today. Life, becoming a Christian doesn't mean life gets easier in one sense. You still will deal with many of the same afflictions that this world has. But we deal with those things in hope. That one day, even the very worst thing that can happen to us, which is death, even that will lead to paradise. Even that will lead to perfection. Even that will lead to the greatest joy. In other words, the very, the very worst thing that can happen to us now becomes the very best thing that can happen to us. That gives hope. That gives strength to endure. That gives the ability to sustain all kinds of afflictions and trials and difficulties. So one day we will be with Jesus. Matthew tells us in his gospel that both of the two thieves, each of them, were mocking Jesus on the cross. Both thieves. They were both making fun of Jesus. And now Luke tells us that one thief repents and turns to Jesus. And someone sometimes wondered, is that, uh, is that the Bible contradicting itself? And the answer, I don't I think, is no. I think you explain that by realizing that this second thief, even moments before this event that Luke records for us, moments before, this man too was mocking Jesus. But something happened to change that. Something transformed this man to help him see who Jesus really was. Now, we don't know for sure what that was, but I want to suggest to you that the answer is found in the text we looked at last week. It's just a few verses before uh, when Jesus, in verse 34, when Jesus says this, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. This second thief, I imagine, in doing the same torture that Jesus is, and he sees Jesus in all that pain and agony and anguish, Jesus still finds the strength to forgive the very people who were torturing and killing him. And that second thief, I imagine, wonders, how can he do that? What gives him that that strength. And then when he recognizes that Jesus is so different, I suspect that changed him. And you know, that's, that's what changes us too, isn't it? When we, when we see that God looks upon us in our imperfection, in our misery, and in our brokenness, and in our sin, truthfully, who we really are, who we really are, and yet he goes to the cross to forgive us. Coming to the Lord's table here in just a moment, and this table again reminds us of that prayer that God prays for us, forgive them. And He pays the price to make that forgiveness happen for us. The table reminds us of the truth of who we really are, that we are fallen, broken people in need of a Savior, but it reminds us of the grace that is offered to us in Jesus Christ, that God paid the price of His own Son, His own flesh and blood. To set us free. And the table reminds us of the hope that one day we too will see Jesus. We will be with him in paradise. As we come to the table, let's again receive that grace and that mercy offered so free. Let's pray together. Our Father and our God, we delight in your grace and the mercy that you so freely offer us. Lord, we are broken people and are fallen people. But in you, we are redeemed people. We are forgiven. You changed us. You continue to change us. And you will one day perfect us. Strengthen us and sustain us with that hope, we pray. In Jesus' name.